All right, so Derek Hunter, welcome to the show, man. Really glad that you made the time, and it's nice to hear your voice again. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure to be uh, talking with you here again, and, and definitely, and especially so, um, just on your show, which I have admired a great deal for some time. You've had some amazing hosts on here before, and uh, just uh, really uh, have a lot of admiration and respect for your show, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that... Uh, it's going to be ending soon, so I just really appreciate you having me on the show uh, and giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, my latest book, uh, Love, Chaos, and Theory and Practice. Yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, thank you for saying that. I really do appreciate that. It means a lot to me. And uh, it's always hard to walk away from things that you, know, you put all this time and effort and energy into, but... Yes. At the same time, it's like, you know, you just kind of feel it in your bones that it's it's just time to move away and start something new. So, uh, sure, sure. you know, we'll get into the book in just a moment. I should probably, you know, tell the audience, too, that you you were here before. Uh, we did yes. a chat previously about the uh, most recent Terry Gilliam film, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. I really enjoyed talking to you about that, and uh, this is yeah, actually going to be a... Yeah, I, I thought it was great. You know, it's not something like those kind of chats are not not ones I get to have much anymore. You know, just talking to somebody about a piece of art that we both admire. So I don't think yeah. this chat's going to be even close to that one in terms of, you know, breaking something down like that. Because, well, I, you know, I guess it will be. We're going to break something different down. It's not going to be a film. Yeah, it's sure, yeah, yeah. Kind of your own mind and brain that we're going to we're going to pick <laughs> apart here on some level. So you, know, you mentioned your latest book. Uh, Love, Chaos, and Theory in Practice. That just came out. It follows the publication of a book in 2014 that you put out called Love, Chaos. And Love, Chaos is, you know, something that you're going to have to describe to us. It's, you need to sort of lay the foundation of what this term or what this what this principle means to you, where it came from, and, you know, at what point, I guess, in your personal experiences here you thought it was a good idea to start i guess what you're calling you know like your own personal religion or philosophy or you know insert whatever noun makes sense here so you know tell us a little bit about how love chaos as an embodiment of you know religious or spiritual practice came to be in your life you know where were you when you when you thought about this and and why did you want to to write these books to begin with i guess yeah, sure. Um, well, I think it's really important to know that when I first started Love Chaos in, in 2014, it was something that came out of a time, a really dark time in my life. Um, you know, the 12-steppers, the people who go to 12-step meetings, they call a point uh, what's called rock bottom uh, in their life when the, uh, through their addiction to whatever it may be, alcohol or drugs or whatever, uh, they hit a, a certain, like a low, like the lowest point. And for each person, that low point can be different. Um, some people, it could be as low as uh, losing a loved one or, or actually taking another person's life or going to prison for, for decades or the rest of their life. Or, you know, each person has a different low. Some people's, you know, rock bottom could be um, just having health issues with whatever problem that they have. Um, I won't go into all the details of my life, but basically in 2014, you know, through a lot of substance abuse issues to to not only alcohol, but to hard drugs um, for a number of years. And in and, and a certain lifestyle that was associated with that, which was a very um, romanticized notion of what it meant to be an artist, because I was, a, you know, pretty much for my whole life, a, either a writer or before that, a filmmaker and just and before that, an, an artist, you know, with, the, with drawings and painting and I've always been a very creative person and my, my creativity was, was strongly attached to substance. Um, and, and I really, since my teens sort of, um, really aligned myself with the, the, the French poet, Arthur Rimbaud's, um, notion that, um, uh, the derangement, the long prolonged derangement of the senses, uh, through substances led to like, a an opening up of a, a visionary way of living and opened up the artist to um, certain pathways that could make their art um, not only just a great work of art, but also open it up to um, new perceptions and new ways of living. So I really just sort of, you know, associated myself with that. And uh, 
but but living that kind of lifestyle of excess and having the the sort of the, the candle burning on both ends uh just was really not healthy um especially just not for my own life but for being a father to my son and uh just not being you know i i always loved my son and even through my my darkest times i i always loved him but the the my my love and then my actions in terms of my self destructiveness didn't match um so both out of my own wanting to sort of uh, uh you know save my own life but also be there for my son i realized i had to make a big change and throughout my life i've i've been very um i very i have a hard time with um sort of like be, you know, believing in something because I had to, um, following authority because I had to. Um, I've always felt that it was really important to, I, I didn't have necessarily an issue with authority in and of itself, but I had an issue with it if it didn't seem to really um, help me in my life. And I felt that a lot of times, a lot of belief systems cause problems with my life. So, uh, you know, and there were different times in my life where there was a period in my early 20s when I was really hardcore into a kind of a Gnostic Christianity that infused Buddhism as well. And I, I, I read the Bible, I prayed every day, and uh, I meditated every day, and then I tried to convert everyone in my life uh, to become Christian. Uh, and then I became a hardcore, uh, uh, you know, peace activist in my 20s. Uh, I became, when I was a filmmaker, I became a hardcore sort of devotee or follower of, of the filmmaker John Cassavetes. Uh, which fueled a lot of my drinking and just living it up lifestyle. Uh, but throughout, you know, even throughout a lot of these years, I always had sort of a questioning of authority uh, and, and, and sort of like this agnosticism. And it was deeply rooted in, in, in embracing doubt. And so when I, when I, in 2014, when I came to the understanding that I had to make a big change, I had considered, you know, believing in a traditional belief system, whether it would be to be born again as a Christian, like once again, which I already had done before in my early 20s, uh, or another belief system, Islam, Buddhism, uh, just a whole number of different beliefs that I considered, you know, believing in and joining in and changing my life with that belief system, or go to the 12 steps and, and, and use that as, as a way to save me, save myself, change myself. And it just none of these belief systems, while I found a lot of value in them, it just didn't really sit well with me. And so I always viewed life as essentially chaotic in nature, that life was basically uh, unpredictable. Um, sometimes you could predict it. Sometimes you couldn't. Um, sometimes you could have some control. Sometimes you couldn't. And um, it, as soon as you felt like you had some grasp or understanding of life, uh, life always found a way to kind of slide through your fingers. If you had it in your grasp, it would sort of find a way to change up your perspective, change up your way of living. So I, I felt like, well, since I found life to be this way, you know, from my own personal experiences and looking at life, looking at the history of mankind, where we are at right now, uh, I felt it would be, it would help me to embrace um, chaos. And that doesn't necessarily mean chaos is inherently bad or inherently evil. Um, it can be, um, but it can also be beneficial. And so within this chaotic universe that we live in, I felt it was important to um, to focus on and act on love, love for other people, love for myself. And uh, and from that basic, you know, guiding principle, uh, love chaos was born. And so from that point, I just had these ideas kind of come come to me and kind of bombard me at the time. And I, it's like, I felt I needed to write them down. And so I ended up writing down 45, what I call like insights into what love chaos was about or what it meant to me and what I wanted to share with other people. Uh, and so that's where that first book uh, of love chaos came about. Um, I think it's important too, just real quickly, because then I've been talking for a while, but just real quickly, like if love chaos is a religion, you know, it's a very non-dogmatic religion. Um, it's it's a religion only in the sense that it has certain principles uh, that one can go by, uh, and uh, and and that would be beneficial to someone. 
but really like it's very inclusive to all kinds of uh, walks of life and beliefs. A person could be uh, an atheist. One doesn't have to be spiritual. Uh, one can be a Christian. One could be a Satanist. One could be a, 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 a Muslim, a Buddhist. One could be a, an occult practitioner, a, a neo-pagan. Uh, all, all forms and walks of life are, are welcome uh, on the path of love chaos. The key sort of elements, though, is that people must have doubt about their belief systems uh, and be willing to accept or, or have a, at least a small portion of their beliefs feel that um, they might be wrong. Um, that perhaps uh, what they believe in is not necessar necessarily the way things are, and just being willing to be okay with doubt. And so that was sort of the beginning of Love Chaos, and uh, there's a lot more to it, but I'll just, I'll, I'll end there for now. Well, I mean, you're more than welcome to keep going, man, so <laughs> I want to hear you talk. I don't, I don't want to have to say much, but, you know, the, yeah, it's a, it's, it was an interesting journey for you to, to get to that point. I didn't obviously know a lot of what you were talking about in terms of, you know, your own battles here, your own internal struggles. We all have them. They come in different right. shapes and sizes and flavors, obviously. And, you know, I've talked on the show many times about how I came into the occult and don't need to rehash that. But it was during a similar phase, you know, just this really sort of low, you know, depressed state, uh, low self-esteem, low self-confidence, things like that. Just trying to find answers, you know, in something. So... You know, sure, sure. and love chaos is obviously, you know, it's a play on words. Love can act as a verb in that phrase, you know, like love chaos, embrace chaos, like kind of what you were talking about there. But it's also two nouns, you know, love and chaos, you know, and we, yes. we, we know what chaos is. That's obviously, I don't think it's sort of a self-explanatory word, you know, just you describe it as this sort of, it's kind of the fundamental principle of life here. It's chaotic, you know, the universe is chaotic and i don't think i don't think a lot of people would disagree with that because I, I i think especially when you talk about these more occult or esoteric belief systems it it really is centered on you know kind of that order out of chaos principle that you hear you know it's kind of you kind of hear it in conspiratorial circles as a bad thing but it's not necessarily a bad thing i don't think you know i guess it just depends on your perspective right so but you asked this uh, question in the second book, obviously, the one that just came out, Love, Chaos, and Theory and Practice. You know, since love is so important for love chaos, what is love? And I think we need to define that from your perspective. What is love, Derek? Yeah, sure. I think it's really important to know that, um, you know, I think like what I, I mentioned in the book, like it definitely isn't isn't owned like this. Love isn't owned by by Christianity. It's not owned by John Lennon. It's not owned by the hippies. It's not owned by anyone, you know, and I really wanted to make it clear in the book that uh, a, a Satanist could have just as much love in their life as a Christian. An atheist could have just as much love in their life as, uh, as uh, some new age spiritualist. you know? Um, I think that a lot of times people get hung up on labels and they feel, you know, where they, you know, I practice white magic or I practice black magic and, I really feel like people's actions in life and their intentions in life are really what determines on how much love someone is, is, is um, focusing their energy on and their, and their actions on. And um, for me, you know, love is very, it has to be very um, much about, you know, having compassion for yourself, having compassion for other people, having concern for other people being very passionate about life, about, about our own lives, about other people's lives, not taking it for granted. Um, understanding that whatever we have, this life is, is what we're living right here, right now. And, uh, to not throw it away. Um, and, in, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, if we really want to be sincere about the love that we're giving to other people or to ourselves, we really should have like a deep love, um, for humanity or for existence itself. Um, and I think that a lot of times people get stuck on certain notions or certain labels of what, what love is and it, it, it can get in the way of their actually living out love. And um, I think it's also important to know that love is messy. Um, it's not clean um, or it can be clean sometimes, but um, it can be messy too. 
Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, not giving up on love is, is a really true deep love. Um, consistently being there for people, uh, consistently being there for yourself, you know, um, and, and, and love has a lot of different ways of expressing itself. You know, uh, when I, when my son was born, you know, that moment to me was the, was the most beautiful moment of my life. And to, to see him, you know, coming, holding his mother's hand, being by her side, uh, it was a C-section, so I couldn't see him coming out. They had it blocked. But just hearing as they were cutting away at the layers of her stomach and then and hearing his screaming coming through her, her, her tummy and then just being pulled out and covered in blood and ooze and all this other stuff, it was just so overwhelming. And it was just like um, such an intense feeling of love. Um, it, w- it was like, to me, it was a love for something outside of myself and a love of myself too, because as you know, when we have children, it's an extension of ourselves. Um, and I think in some ways, like that kind of love that we have for our kids, for us as parents, um, maybe it's not necessarily required that we have that same kind of love for everybody, but that's that I think there should be some kind of element there that is similar in the sense that when we love our kids, we're loving something or someone outside of ourselves, but we're also loving a part of us. And, you know, when we're walking down the street and we're seeing strangers or friends that we know or family members or whoever, we can definitely have problems with them and we need to take care of ourselves and guard ourselves from these other people for sure, because we need to protect ourselves and love ourselves. But I think there there has to be somewhere deep down this understanding that there is some kind of connection, you know, it, 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 it may be just purely, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be some kind of spiritual thing. Like, again, I'm not promoting uh, some what love chaos has to be spiritual. It could, you know, someone could be completely materialistic and still practice love chaos. But even for them, you could still find a bond, a humanist bond with other people, um, with loving them and, and, and really um, finding as much of a way to connect with them as much as possible. So, you know, I think, a lot of love is, is, is a living out of it and, 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 and acting it out in day-to-day living. I think that's where you'll find uh, a real deep sense of love. Um, and so that to me is where love is, is at its most important. Yeah. I don't have a child, so I am, you know, I guess I'm not unfamiliar with, with, with that type of love. I mean, I, I'm a child myself. I have a mother and a father, so I think I've experienced that in some way, maybe in reverse of what you're talking about. But, you know, I'm curious. I always have this sort of like philosophical debate within myself and I guess with other people, too, about different types of love. And I don't know like where I've I don't think I've ever settled on it. You know, I'm always back and forth on. Well, there's just love. Love is love is love. It doesn't matter who it's with. It doesn't matter what the type of relationship is, you know, whatever. But then I go to the flip side and I'm like, well, do I love my parents in the same way I love a spouse or a significant other? You know, do I love my significant other in the same way that I would love a child, for example? And just from your experience, you've experienced all of this. Are there different types of love here? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think I think probably up until my the birth of my son, the other greatest form of love that I experienced was romantic love, you know, and, and being in love with someone. Um, and up until my son's birth, there was a few women that I was like deeply, deeply passionately in love with. And, um, and it really does when you fall in love with someone, it may sometimes be delusional. It may even be harmful, um, to oneself, uh, because a lot of times when you fall deeply in love with someone, you're not really seeing things logically. Um, and, and so it can be dangerous, but I think in terms of that exalted state of really feeling alive, you know, um, it's something that I think it it really cannot be taken away. And, um, as much as I love my parents and and my, my, my dad and my mother, you know, I, before my son, it wasn't really until after my son was born that I really, uh, will start to have a, a deeper appreciation of my mother, for example. Um, and then even a deeper appreciation of, of the love my father had for me in the last uh, nine years of his life before he passed away, like three months after my son was born. Um, 
So I, you know, I definitely feel like there's all, there's many, many different forms of love for love between friends, you know, like that's a really important and really important experience to have. Um, the love between strangers. Um, sometimes that can be very significant because it's like, you don't know this person, they don't know you. And yet you could find something to connect with in a deep way. Um, the love that people can have at meetings, whether they be, they be at 12 step meetings or other kind of peer to peer support meetings um, is, is ex- extremely valuable because again, I think human beings really feel like they want to connect with other human beings. And there's a lot of different ways that we can connect to other people. Um, and, and really all those different ways of experiencing love is, are, um, are very important, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I do know that now in your love chaos, you know, belief system, you say that this really focuses on a certain kind of love and a certain kind of chaos and you may have already talked about that in some way with the love there, but you know maybe re- reiterate what you mean by these certain kinds of love and chaos. How would you define these? Oh yeah, I think I remember that's something I wrote in the first book, um, and the one that came out in 2014. So yeah, um, so I think it's, it's important to know that you know um, that the certain kind of of love, for example, that one if you're following the path of love chaos. Um, there are many different kinds of love. So, so for example, people can fall in love. Like we just, I just mentioned it earlier, just a few minutes ago and falling in love can be a beautiful, wonderful experience. Um, it can also be very, again, like I said earlier, very destructive because what happens a lot of times I've been both, both guilty of this myself in my own life. And I've also been re- on the receiving end of this too, of a very possessive love. Um, I've seen romantic love, as beautiful as it can be turned into one of the most harmful and destructive um, experiences that one can have. And it's really sad. Um, And when, when one person turns that love for another into wanting to possess that other person uh, and turning that other human being into an object, um, that really is not the kind of love that one should be following, you know, in, in love chaos. Um, the love of oneself should be something that people should cherish and you should love yourself, but also that shouldn't turn into an obsessive self-love where, um, people are just so, um, vain and, and really into themselves and just out of, out of the sacrificing the concerns or, or needs or interests of other people. Um, that, that self, that kind of self-love is, is again, I think would be harmful and should not be practice or followed or it should be avoided as much as possible um the love of of all kinds of things you can turn something that is inherently good love into something that is very destructive and um so when it comes to love chaos one should be very conscious of what you're what you're loving and how you're loving and is it truly deeply um love as pure as it can be um and uh, and in terms of chaos you know, again, most people's associations with chaos is that it's a bad word. It's a dirty word. It's evil. And, um, and I think, uh, it's certainly, like I said earlier, it can be that way. Um, but in, if you're following the path of love chaos, the chaos that you want to embrace is one that is not seeking out to do harm to others. It's not seeking out to do harm to yourself to just say, ah, fuck, you know, screw the world. Uh, I'm just chaos. Let's worship chaos, chaos and destruction. And just, you know, just let's live it up in excess. And it's really important for people to follow love chaos to, to understand that that's not the point. Um, that's not the, you know, let's not, we're not trying to create a a chaos to the point that is causing destruction to other people. Um, that is definitely not a chaos that I would, uh, embrace. And and if you're following the path of chaos, that's not what, what you should be doing either. Yeah, so wait, so what's this particular kind of chaos that you're talking about too? Is did we touch on that? So uh yeah, sure. It would be it would be basically I think one of the one of the key ways of, to to understand how this particular way of chaos that could be beneficial to people is doubt. Um having doubt is I think can be very helpful to people and I think that may be alien to 
to a lot of people because we've been told for so many centuries that faith is is really the cornerstone to salvation and to helping people and um and certainly faith has helped people and it can and it, and it will continue to uh but i think having in the embrace of doubt having be, being basically open to uh being flexible to um things that may not be true uh even your own beliefs um so it in terms of how it's helped me, for example, is that when I approach um, an experience, an experience that I may have either at my job or with my son or with my interactions with people, is to have uh, as much as I can the willingness to be open to other possibilities um, and being willing to, like, I may come to a, a situation with a certain perception, a certain way of de- I made a decision, this is how I'm going to be. Uh, but a lot of times something will be thrown at me and I have to be willing to um, navigate my way through that experience so that I'm willing to change and adapt to the circumstances. Um, and again, it, this is not just doing it for the sake of being an opportunist at all. It's more about being flexible and being open to how experience really is and embracing it in that way. Um, so it's really has, has to do with doubt and flexibility um, and open-mindedness is really what the, the chaos that's implied here that should be embraced. Yeah. I, myself, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I hate to say this. I, I'm not following this belief system that you've laid out here, you know, in the way that you've like laid it out, but I am in a way too, you know, like I, it, it's funny. Like when I was reading through both books, I was like, Oh yeah, like this is kind of how I think. And this is kind of how I feel. This is kind of how I behave or, you know, I guess want to behave, you know, maybe I'm not fully there yet in some areas, but it's definitely like, it resonates with me. So something else that resonates with me is you, you say like there are foundational philosophical concepts of this that we haven't yet touched on. And one of them is that you say this in the first book, and then you also talk about it a bit in the second book, but that this love chaos belief system doesn't see spirituality as divorced from emotions and the five senses, and that the mind is just one of several aspects. And I, I love that because I think it's one of those things that get lost when you are talking about a spiritual or a religious belief system is that you tend to almost disregard your own material body and the way that, I don't know, I guess the way that there's a material component, I I guess, that gets almost disregarded completely. And you kind of can lose sight of taking care of your physical body because you're too focused on maybe like spiritual practices or beliefs that, you know, don't really enhance your experience here right now in the present moment. So, you know, where, where do you like, I guess, how do you blend the two together in this belief system so that it is sort of on equal footing? Sure. Um, I think so. It's important to know, like, one of the things for me anyway, and I think um, for someone who wants to follow the path of love chaos is at least work on this and being open to it as a possibility is being okay with different possibilities. Um, So that would mean that in terms of most people try to tend to see the spiritual uh, versus the materialists as two opposing philosophical concepts that are at, like at war. And you see that a lot in a lot of different, not just in the occult world, but in a lot in the new age world and a lot of different uh, religious institutions and so forth. And as to show that there's somehow the materialist vision and the spiritual vision are at, are at war in conflict. And, um, and I, and I don't think they necessarily have to be true. I'm okay with having the universe being just completely explainable in materials terms. I'm fine with that, you know, but I'm also fine with the fact with the possibility that that may be not true, that, that there might be a spiritual dimension to this existence that we're living in. There may be something beyond what we're experiencing with our five senses. And so it, it, it's important for me to be okay with either one, or perhaps that they're both so in some weird kind of way, they both might be true. Um, so, but in terms of how that applies to my day-to-day living, it's really important, I think, that um, 
we take care of our bodies. Uh, we have to understand that. Uh, I, so like I go to the gym, I go to the gym four times a week. Um, you know, I have, I, I, I do have a, te- a tendency to have an, an addictive personality. So when I do something, I, I go all the way. So like I, with my, with that, you know, um, I, I, I love going to the gym. It's, it is kind of, it's an addiction to me for me. And I, I love going there. I, I, my prime focus is to, to burn calories. I've lost a lot of weight in the last year and, and I feel great. I, I, I get the natural high from going to the gym and sweating it out, burning all those calories. And it feels fantastic, you know, and, um, to be going to the gym with all these other people with the same purpose there, or some people to build muscle. Uh, for me, I'm not really interested in building muscle. Um, I'm just interested in keeping the weight off. And as a middle-aged man, that's what I have to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I really like to take care of myself, uh, physically, you know, and, and part of that for me, because of my substance abuse issues of my past that meant, has meant abstaining from not just hard drugs and, and weed, but also alcohol too. And cigarettes, I had to quit cigarettes. I had to quit alcohol. Um, I had to, uh, um, even quit, ca- uh, not caffeine. I drink, I do enjoy and love tea, but I, I, I don't drink coffee anymore and, uh, I feel great. And I feel like that taking care of my body has been, really beneficial to my mental state, my psychological state. And if it does exist, because again, I'm ag- agnostic. If I have a soul, it seems that it, it definitely seems to be helping my soul as well. So there, and just really just, you know, really experiential terms, day-to-day living, I, I found that the two together can, can work in harmony. Well, as they should, right? I mean, I th- I think we're, yeah. we're we're blending here the spiritual and the material to find that balance. And to be honest, like this is man, I'm going to go on a, maybe a bit of a rant here, but this is sure. the one one thing that I have a problem with, or maybe not the one thing, but the major thing I have a problem with when I have gotten into these conversations with occultists or new age mysticists or whatever. I mean, even I guess some, you know, traditional religious types, you know, is like this, this constant focus on the ethereal or, you know, like the afterlife, or just this, like this place that we don't even really know if it exists. Like, like you just said, you're agnostic and you don't even know if you have a soul, but if you do, then you assume that what you're doing here now is helping that. And I, and I would agree. I, I don't know if we have a soul. I don't know what the word spirit really refers to anymore. I don't know what exists beyond here and now. And I'm t- and I just got tired of focusing on that, you know? Like I've been down this path, this rabbit hole for years now and I'm just like, ah, I have neglected myself in some way. Like my physical self has has like be- become, you know, sort of out of shape and I just, I haven't felt well. And I was, I was searching for answers outside of me, outside of the present moment, outside of my body even. And it didn't make me feel good. You know, it didn't make me feel like I was enjoying life, which is this precious, precious gift that we have to just be here like now breathing and, and being able to, you know, find love or embrace chaos, you know? And it's just like, I just got so almost like resentful and bitter towards these sorts of belief systems. So the the fact that what you wrote here resonated with me because you did not neglect this part of the experience, I really enjoy that. And I just wanted to point that out Ooh. for the audience here. And, you know, some of the other foundational uh, philosophical concepts for Love Chaos, you know, I just want to touch on them here briefly Sure. And, just ha- yeah. and just have you talk about them. But I just pulled out two because they are a big part of my life. And uh, one of them, you know, let's start with this, sex. You know, sex is one of those things. It's a physical act <laughs> that we all enjoy. You know, let's not kid ourselves here. We all enjoy sure. having sex with each other, maybe with ourselves or whatever. So, yeah. you know, how do you in this belief system view sex or the act of sex? Yeah, sure. Just, uh, just, I just want to touch on what you just said before this, though, too. Just it was really important what you were talking about. I think it's um, before we jump into this, is that um, you know, like, I, so you know, I, I practice magic. Obviously, I do rituals, and I have been for the t- last ten years. And I have found that it's very important that I only do them once in a while. I only do two rituals uh, a year. I do, I do daily practices as well. 
But when it comes to the occult, it's like you say, it's like it's there's just so much there, there's so much knowledge, there's so much mental stuff to just stuff your your brain with. And um one can get, as you say, get get stuck down that rabbit hole and it can lead towards really just really dark places. And um I've always felt that, you know, I, I feel that um occult practices need to be balanced with daily living. And, um, and I, I just want to mention like all the things that you've done for a culture has been extremely important. Um, I think that all the people that you've interviewed has been, it's just been a really amazing show that you've done. And it's something that I think has benefited you, um, just from my own perspective. So I think it, maybe once you've gotten out of this experience of a, of a culture, you might look back in say five or 10 years and look back at what you did and just really see like, wow, that's a lot of amazing work right there. And it, I'm just saying this because I think that there is some benefit to it. But like you say, when one goes into it too heavily, too strongly, it can cause, it definitely can cause problems for, for anyone. But uh, anyway, so, but I just wanted to mention that. And, and um, so uh, sex. Yeah. Well, um, I think a lot of people are intrigued by the occult or the practice of magic um, uh, because of it's, there's a, you know, sexual nature. And, um, it's very sensual, it's, it's seductive, it embraces sex and it utilizes sex and orgasm to achieve certain things and experiences. Um, I feel like that it, um, really, when, when we look at sex, it really gives us an opportunity to, um, be as, as much as possible, um, in, in a, in a heightened state, um, with our lover or by ourselves too, which is fine and, and can be just as fulfilling in some ways. Um, and, um, I think it's something that it, it should be embraced. Um, and certainly what's helped me tremendously is the practice of, uh, of, of things that I've incorporated over the years from, from different people who came before me is to utilize, uh, sex in ways that can really, uh, enrich my life. Um, and so, you know, I think sex is definitely something that is something that is just completely natural. Um, I think that we've, we've inherited, there's a lot of things I, 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 I love about the monotheistic faiths, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but on the downside, I feel that they've for centuries have associated, uh, sensuality with evil. And, um, and I really feel like that's been extremely harmful, um, to our, our species. And, uh, in the last couple hundred years, we've really been able to kind of break away from a lot of those hangups and a lot of those issues that we have about sex. Um, and we still have issues. It's, it's, it's kind of weird nowadays how we have, there's like a, a fetishist kind of attitude towards sex. Um, and it's, it's, um, there's certain things about it that are okay, but I think there's also a certain unhealthy um, kind of way that we're dealing with sex nowadays. And, um, you know, I think it really, when we look at sex, it gives us an opportunity to be in the moment as much as possible with ourselves, with other people, and and really um, just find a way to be our, who we really are. And and with ourselves and with other people and our true nature, um, and so I think something that Love Chaos would would really want to help people with is to have a healthy attitude and experience with sex. Yeah, I think that's important because I mean, it is. Well, it's not it's not an everyday part of our lives, maybe, but it could be, and it is yeah. a very important part of our lives because you know, one, I guess, just on a very sort of uh, utilitarian level, it, it's the proliferation of our species, right? Like it, it is the base act on how right. we recreate each other, you know, like in a way. So it's important, I guess, to have a healthy relationship with that act. It's also, you know, I mean, because of that, it's an act of creation, you know, and. Thus, I right. think a work of art, you know, I guess if you know how to do it well, maybe <laughs> I'm sure people out there have had some experiences that were not so artistic, you know, but it can be, you know, and I think we look right. at that right. as a, 
that that's a positive thing, you know, like sex is meant to be enjoyed. It's also, you know, meant to create something, whether that's another human life or whether that's just an orgasm. Like it's meant to create something inside of you that is meant to be experienced and meant to be enjoyed. And it's, right. it's not this like, you know, sort of evil devilish act that, you know, maybe some belief systems might impress upon it. But, you know, I just think that it's important to have a healthy relationship with it because we've right. seen people, I'm sure we all know people who have unhealthy, you know, sort of experiences in those areas and the, their relationship with the act of sex is, is addictive, you know, like there are sex right. addicts, there are, there are porn addicts and man, they really, really, really like, you know, porn's free for a reason, right? It's meant to get you addicted and it's meant to sort of, I guess, almost destroy that experience for you. You know, it's just like how, you know, if you're an alcoholic, it actually destroys the experience of just enjoying a nice glass of wine sometimes, which can be beneficial for your health in some ways, you know? So, sure, sure. but I mentioned, you know, sex as an art form and I don't know if that's actually true, but I kind of see it maybe that way. But art is also something that, you know, we talked about a film last time we broke down this, this piece of art that we both experienced in different ways here. And, you know, sex is art. I don't know. We could debate that too, but sure. you know, but well, art, just, oh, go ahead. Just, no, I'm sorry. Uh, just real quickly, I think it's important too when it comes to sex that um, I think in terms of when we're talking about it being healthy and in a work of art, I think sometimes like when I look at my own experiences, uh, it's important for me to be honest about the experience, uh, about the insecurities that come up because I think a lot of times there's are, there are insecurities that come up when we are in the middle of lovemaking, prior to lovemaking, after lovemaking. Because there's a lot of just feelings involved between you and the other person that come up. And, um, and if you really look for really honest with ourselves, we can look at our, our lovemaking experiences, our sexual encounters with other people and uh, in ways where you can see how it affects the rest of your life. And, and, it, and, it, and it, I, you see this, I think, in this country in particular, a denial of those kinds of experiences. We either like to idealize it where we like to make it really trashy and um, you know, uh, it's, it, we, we tend to try to, we tend to shy away from the moments when we're, when we're in the middle of, of sex and our, our partner, you know, farts or, you know, or, or we have an uncomfortable moment and uh, we're in the heat of, of, of sex and um, our, uh, our, our, our member down there doesn't work, you know, and there's all these awkward moments that happen, but I think it's an okay to embrace those moments to make them more real, to make them less of a, and in, in, in that sense, I think you can look at it. Those kinds of experiences are works of art too. You know, I think that being vulnerable, vulnerability is really key um, to learning more about yourself. And um, I think if love chaos, it, it's definitely something that one should really embrace and, and understand, you know, yeah, and those experiences that you just described, I mean, those are the random chaotic moments, you know, right. in those like <laughs> in that environment. So, it, there's nothing wrong with it, you know, like you said. Like sometimes exactly. it's not going to go the way that you planned. Like let's just that's right. life in general. So, there's not going right. to be perfect moments, you know, and I know that there are you know some people who get frustrated with themselves if in those sexual environments that they can't perform right, to the right. level that they would like, but the thing is is like you have to embrace that part of yourself. Like, the, like you are not perfect. You are insecure exactly. and love your approach to the, the insecurity, which I do have a question on actually. Uh, but sure. I want to get, I, I want to get back to the art for a moment because that's another, that's another foundational philosophical concept that you talk about in the books. And, you know, how do you view art in this love chaos belief system too? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's really important that, um, I think that for me, uh, and I think it'd be good if, if other people saw themselves this way too, um, is that your own life is a work of art. And uh, if you look at your experiences, your past experiences, the experiences you currently are in the middle of right now, your future experiences, that you are in the process of, of creating a life that is a work of art. And again, it doesn't mean it has to be perfect. It doesn't mean it has to be some idealized state. Because I think, again, like really a lot of times, you know, some great works of art are have imperfections. It has different things about it that creates, um, you know, 
some kind of ambiguity, some kind of uncertainty. Um, but I think it would help people, even if you, if one doesn't feel like they have any creativity in their body at all, in their mind, and, you know, uh, they are a, um, a doctor or a lawyer, a, uh, an engineer or, uh, you know, whatever it may be that one is that you feel like, well, I don't, I'm not creative. How could I turn my life into a work of art? Um, I think you can even still have your life turn into a work of art, you know, and, um, you can just find ways to make your life poignant because I think really like really truly beautiful works of art have some poignancy to them, some sublimity, some moments of sublime ex exalted states. Um, it really heightens the experience. And again, it doesn't have to be spiritual. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Art doesn't have to associate with spirituality. And I think this is where art really is beautiful is that it really art transcends belief systems in a lot of ways. And um, really, the really great works of art uh, do that, you know, whether it's a, a play by William Shakespeare or a piece of music by Beethoven or Mozart or a painting by Picasso, um, their greatness lies not necessarily in their belief system, but in what they're expressing, you know? And um, I think that can be something that everyone can embrace in their own life. I would agree with that. And, you know, there's an artist here that you reference as, you know, a, a major influence over your life here. And I guess what Love Chaos came to be. And you mentioned him in a group of of other people. You called these guys four great thinkers and livers of life. And you mentioned Aleister Crowley, uh, who I've talked about with other people at length here, so we don't need to go too much into him. Uh, you mentioned Robert Anton Wilson, uh, same, you know, talked about him a few times, don't need to go into that. Uh, you mentioned Austin Osmond Spare. He's only come up a couple of times and uh, probably should have devoted more time to his work in this this area. And feel free to talk about him if you'd like. But the one guy I really am interested in that you mentioned with this group is the French uh, writer Albert Camus. And mm -hmm. I have not read all of his work. I've read a few of his novels, uh, many of his short stories. And uh, The Stranger was the first book of his I read in college, actually. It was assigned to me uh, in a class I was in. And man, what a what an existential masterpiece that is. But I, I am curious, like, what it is about Camus that has influenced you, because he's not a name that pops up on this show or others like it very much or at all. Sure. So I'm just I'm just right. interested, like, what about Camus writing or work or life experiences impacted you here? Sure. I think out of those four people, um, Camus is actually the one that I encountered uh, the earliest. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't really get into the occult until about a little over 10 years ago. Um, I um, was always, not always, uh, for the most part, was very skeptical about things, very agnostic about things. And um, the occult world, astrology, you know, tarot readings, all that, I, I used to think it was all bullshit. You know, I used to think it was just a bunch of hogwash. And um, and then I once I started getting into it again, like about 2008 or so, 2009, um, then it changed my perception on that. And then at that point, I started getting into Crowley and Robert Anton Wilson and and Austin Osmond Spare and others, too. But um, but way before that, I encountered Albert Camus and Albert Camus really touched me in a lot of ways um, because you know, for me, I grew up without a religious belief. My parents didn't raise me with religion. Um, they were fine if I wanted to believe in it, but they left it up to me. So throughout my childhood and throughout my teens and into my 20s, um, I kind of viewed life as somehow just, you know, absurd. Um, it could be really great, and, and but it just sort of seemed to lack some kind of purpose to it all, you know? And so when I encountered, you know, Albert Camus and, you know, the stranger and the myth of Sisyphus and the rebel, the rebel being my favorite of his uh, and other works by him, I really felt like, wow, this guy is really saying something really meaningful that essentially, you know, the universe that we live in and, and Albert Camus philosophy, you know, uh, he didn't consider himself an existentialist. I, to me, I think it's fine to call him an existentialist. It's not that different from the existentialist. But basically, he viewed uh, life as inherently absurd. 
and, and pointless. You know, the, 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 the myth of Sisyphus is about this guy Sisyphus pushing this big boulder up a hill. And once he reaches the top of this uh, hill, it falls all the way back down the other side of the hill. And he, he has to repeat the same thing over and over again. And it's, it's pointless. There's no, there's no purpose to his task. There's no purpose to what he's doing. He just, he's just doing it. And, and, and in that just really simple tale, you know, Kent Kimu talks about how that's, that's what our lives are like. There really isn't a purpose to what we're doing. There is no real meaning, but we create the meaning. We create some kind of purpose. Um, it's not given to us. We have to create it ourselves. And that really just struck a chord with me. Um, I really felt like that was very powerful stuff. Um, and to live your life in that way, like life may not have any purpose to it. It may not have any meaning to it so what, whatsoever. When we die, we may die. There's just just this experience that we have. And if it is that way, the best thing we can possibly do is to make it something that we, we give, we create our own meaning to it. And um, we provide our own reason for why we're here. We're the ones that create it. And so that, that, and that was a really big influence on, on Love Chaos. Love Chaos is different than that, but it, it, Albert Camus philosophy was, it was definitely very influential on me and has been for a long time. Yeah. And I don't think it's inherently, you know, wrong or negative to see life that way, that there might not be this deep meaning or purpose to our existence here. I think we like to think that and something I've talked about with somebody else recently too, this that like maybe the, the hubris of being human is that, you know, we, we think these things about ourselves and our experience here that it's just so, you know, sort of different than other living creatures on this earth. And it, it might not be, you know, like, I don't think financial slavery is, you know, <laughs> I don't think that that is this great experience, which you know, a lot of us are living through right now. And, you know, like right. trying to trying to like, you know, sort of exert our power or influence over one another. Like, that's not love. That's just, you know, sort of, I don't know. It's just fucking mean, <laughs> to be honest. Right. So, <laughs> I, I think that a lot of people who are into um, spirituality, who have a religious faith, who are into the occults, who are into, have these really strong beliefs, I think, and that, that there's a real deep purpose to it all. I think if you look honestly at human history in your own life, our own life, my own life, and you look at it, you see like a lot of things happen that like, if there was a purpose to that, it's, it's like, what was that? What was that all about? Like, what was, what was slavery all about? Why did, you know, why did, why did countless genocides have to happen? You know, why did one person die and not another, you know, and like they're, and of course people with spiritual faith will have explanations for it. And they always had over the centuries and they've always have ways of explaining it. But it, it, I think you really, you know, there's an aspect to ourselves that I think is a little unsettled with existence, you know, and you, you, it's a little unsettling when you look at life and you look at all the things that take place in life, all the heartbreak that takes place. And a lot of times it doesn't really seem to serve a purpose. You know, um, I think it's important, you know, maybe life does have a purpose to it. Maybe it does. But I think there's a lot there's a lot of questions, I think, that if people were honest with themselves, they w- they would have about life. Yeah, I, I remember having a, a conversation with a friend a while back and they had just gotten out of a relationship and they were talking about how, well, you know, the person that I broke up with really needed to have their heart broken. They they did not experience that yet. And I was thinking, you know, in the back of my head, like, well, you know, maybe that's true. Like, it, it is important, I think, to to have experiences like that in this life. But to justify, like, your decision sure. in that way, it's, it right. reminds me of, like, how, you know, people who do sort of, you know, have these spiritual belief systems kind of tend to think. Like, it's it's maybe a bit too big picture and a bit too sort of, like, metaphorical, and it, it really does sort of like, it's a justification for shitty behavior sometimes. Now, not that you can't end a relationship for whatever reason, but to sort of like veil it in this, well, like, you know, this sort of like life lesson thing. I don't know. That seems kind of bullshit to me, but sure, sure. whatever. So I think it's, I think that's how, I think that's how uh, nations and, and people have justified enslaving other people um, and, and, and dominating and oppressing other people is that they found like, well, I have. I have a reason. I'm I'm the chosen. We're the chosen ones, and we uh, we we are serving you know God's purpose or 
some other purpose. And it just, you, I think you really hit it, the nose on the head. It just, it's, it really ultimately is a way to justify, I think. Um, and, you know, there are different reasons for it too. It's complicated, but I think a big part of it is um, justification, you know? Yeah, this actually sort of bleeds well into a part in the second book where you're talking about the psychology of love chaos. And you wrote something here that I want to read and then maybe talk about. Um, you wrote that, quote, a vitally important aspect that needs to be dealt with from the beginning and until the end of our lives is the discomfort of living. And you go on to say uh, that the love chaos psychology seeks to help individuals come to terms with their insecurities, which is something that, you know, we had touched on earlier and that there are ways to live with and accept our discomfort of living. But it means having the willingness to not run away. No amount of running away will make it disappear. It will always be there, but that's okay. This is, you know, part of what it means to be alive. We are insecure. Uh, end quote. And I love that because we have all dealt with our own, you know, insecurities on some level or on a lot of levels. And it's something that we have to overcome to really, you know, truly love ourselves and find success in different areas of our lives. And I'm just, I'm really, really glad that you put that in there and that, that you, I guess, sort of think and feel the same way, probably from your own experiences as well. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, it, it I think that it's, it's important to know from, from moment to moment, again, a lot of this is being, you know, honest with yourself, honest with myself, we're all, all of us sort of taking a look at ourselves in terms of what we're feeling um, in any given moment. And if you look at, at how you're feeling, you can, there's different degrees of comfort, of, of uh, self-confidence, of, uh, of being secure that for sure, we, we definitely experience, we definitely feel secure. We can feel these things for sure. But there is this element of insecurity um, that I think is really important to acknowledge. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times we as human beings like to ignore this um, because we want to hang on to something. And that goes back to like this addictive aspect of human beings uh, that we, we all tend to find something to latch on to some kind of security that gives us pleasure that makes us feel good that gives us some sense of stability and um but really i feel like with real true personal growth is embracing the fact that we have these insecurities and you can then deal with them in a way where you know as you go through your day-to-day experiences you're not going to um be making decisions that are going to be harmful to other people or, or, or yourself. Um, and, and, and when you, when you embrace insecurity, um, it's a, a way of embracing your own humanity. And when you embrace your own humanity, then you can really truly uh, help other people, I think. Um, and, and, and when we do that, we're really helping ourselves. Um, but, you know, it, in the process of like these last five years of my own, well, coming up on six, um, I found that that's been a, a key, key component to my sort of um, getting better, uh, a recovery, if you want to call it, or rehabilitation or whatever one wants to call it. Um, a big key component to my getting better was accepting the fact that I could be insecure, that I could have these feelings that aren't necessarily um, the best for me to have, but I, I see them there. They're there. I accept them. Uh, I don't want to, uh, uh, give them a lot of attention, a lot of time and a lot of my energy. I, I want to be able to, to grow. Um, and so, but, you know, having that ability to, to accept my insecurities and for, for all of us to do it in that way, I think would really help us as a species, um, evolve. I think so too. And I think that, if you don't identify or you aren't able to identify what those insecurities are in your own persona or your own character, your own life, that, I mean, they're going to continue to dominate over you. They will continue to dictate to you how you behave, how you treat yourself, how you treat other people. And, you know, that's a important life lesson that I've come to in the last, you know, probably five years. And it's probably something that this show has helped sort of highlight in my own life as well is, you know, what, what are my insecurities? And, 
how can I, you know, not overcome them because I don't think you can overcome them completely, but kind of like alchemically speaking, how can I sort of transmute those? How can I sort of, I guess, like, like integrate those into myself, you know, like further my own self growth here by acknowledging them and working with them, you know, because I think I do see them on some level as, as kind of like, you know, not things that are external to me, but things that I can manipulate and things that are just sort of like, they're kind of like energetic strands of things that I can push and pull on here and there. Like, dude, if I want to be possessive and jealous and controlling, I can do that very easily. But how do I take those sorts of behaviors and utilize them to more positively, you know, benefit me and to more positively like influence my life and my relationships with other people and myself, you know, because there there are aspects of all these negative traits, you know, like jealousy, you know, that there's something about that, that you can utilize as a positive thing, as a positive motivator, you know, but it's not something you want to dip into too much because that's when you become right. addicted to it. You know, you come, you become addicted to the behavior of, you know, possessing someone else, like you said, your lover or your partner or whoever. And, you know those things right. are 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 negative when you go down that sort of immersive path with them but i think inherently all of these things are neutral and it's just how you utilize them that makes the difference in a positive or a negative experience definitely definitely and, and and i think a lot of times you see people with like extreme belief systems a lot of it is fueled by insecurities you know I think a lot of people who have hatred for other people based on race, based on gender or what have you, um, a lot of those, those, those beliefs that these people have are based out of, they're somehow insecure themselves. They're not dealing with it in a healthy way. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, that phrase, use that phrase that I uh, read in that quote a few minutes ago, the discomfort of living. Is there anything more to say about that phrase? Uh, well, I think it, it, I, it's something that, it's it's important, I think. Again, as as much as someone becomes enlightened, as some as much as someone becomes aware and conscious, and as much as as other people see a person as being that way, it's important to know that that discomfort of living again will always be with us. And and that's why I'm really against this whole notion of of being a of people being a guru, of people uh, claiming to be more. Um, enlightens than other people, you know, uh, uh, I feel like that is a, a real big trap, um, for people to get caught up in dogma, um, and, and, and really, uh, an easy way to fall into controlling other people. And again, it's all based on the fact that people aren't really truly honestly coming to terms with this discomfort of living. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would agree with that too. So, you know, there are, Gosh, there's so much in these books, and I have so many, you know, things I'd love to talk to you about. But I, I think one of the, one of the last things I want to chat about here, man, is, is this, and this kind of goes, I think, goes with what we were talking about with the insecurities of our lives, the discomfort of, of living them here. You and you, you actually said this in the first book, so this is not part of the most recent book. But you wrote that lies are important in this love chaos philosophy or belief system or whatever. And I just thought that was really interesting. Why do you think lies are important? Because I think a lot of people would be like, well, you shouldn't lie. You know, that's a sin or that's, that's not good behavior, but you're sort of, again, embracing these negative experiences and trying to use them, I guess, in a more positive way. So what do you think about lying here? Um, well, I think what's important to know is that like I, I, um, in that first book I did, I do mention that, but I, I feel that a life lived with dominated by honesty is really the way to go. Um, I think that honesty in our actions, honesty with our feelings, honesty with our thoughts, honesty with other people is really, really important. And that we really true, true liberation, if we can, we can call it that comes from living an honest life as much as possible. But then I think it's important to know that again, there's that much as possible. I think that it's really important to understand that we can't always be honest. We can't always be honest with other people, for example. Um, and that the to truly love other people and ourselves, 
it's important to know that there may be times where we may not be it may not be the best thing to do to reveal certain things. And in that, in that sense, it could be considered lying. Um, I don't think lying should be something that should be worshiped or exalted or put on a pedestal at all, but it's just an aspect to our human behavior that we kind of have to, um, we have to embrace and we have to understand it's there. Um, I definitely feel like honesty is far more important than lying. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's good to just have that as an aspect to what we have to do in order to really truly love ourselves and love other people. Yeah, it was, I don't, I don't know. I guess I brought it up because I was sort of surprised that you worded that the way you did, because you, you know, like you said, you, you did say, uh, it's better to live a life dominated by honesty than lies. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but you know, it kind of goes back to this uh gosh it kind of goes back to the occult you know like i think one of the things that i i uh i don't like about it is that it's all very much accessible now like you this, this stuff is supposed to be secret or hidden for a reason but i can right. go on i can go on the internet and i can read all about it so how secret right. or hidden right. is it really and i think that like if we if we look at like what a lie is it like there there's lies where i i can you know, sort of just flat out say that something happened, but it didn't happen or something that didn't happen did happen, you know? And, right. but there's also lies of omission. We're just not telling somebody something at all. And, you know, sometimes people do that to protect other people, to not hurt their feelings or whatever. But I think at the end of the day, like, like you said, man, it's better to just be honest, especially when it becomes, you know, or, or I guess, especially when you sort of venture into this emotional territory, it's better to just be honest about how you feel, or how something makes you feel than it is to, you know, sort of paint it to be something different. Because whether you realize it or not, when, when you're emotionally communicating with somebody, the way that you articulate how you feel or how you think about something absolutely influences how the other person reacts or behaves from that point on. If I know that I do something that you know, sort of irks you or, you know, makes you feel a certain way that's, that's, that's negative. I'm going to, if I'm a good person, I'm going to take that to heart and I'm going to modify my behavior accordingly. Exactly. Right. But right. if I don't right. know that and I keep doing these things that you don't like, but you just won't talk to me about it. How the fuck do I know? Like, how, how do I know that? Like, well, if maybe the way I, I chew my food really annoys you, like that's not like an emotional thing, but you know, this these sort of behavioral things that, if you don't right. tell me that it's a bothersome to you, like I'm not, I'm never going to be able to modify my behavior, and thus, on some way, I'm never going to be able to to improve myself because I think a lot of us take for granted the the role that we have to play sometimes in the lives of our loved ones. Is you kind of have to point out these things that you see as holding somebody back that they might not see. You know, it's like any sort of you know, sort of drug intervention, you know, as somebody who's been through substance abuse issues, like you're probably familiar with that from, you know, I don't know if it's personal experience or just, you know, just knowing that, you know, these types of things have to happen, you know, you have to confront these things. And if you don't do right. it yourself, the people who love you and care about you and who maybe feel some sense of responsibility towards you, they're going to be the ones at some point to have to step in and make you aware of these lies that you're telling yourself on some level. And, you know, I think that's what friends are for. I think that's what, you know, family is for is to just be able to help you confront these things in your own life because you can blind yourself to a lot of bad behavior, man. You can justify, your, you know, this bad behavior by saying, well, I broke that person's heart because they needed to experience that. Well, okay, but maybe you shouldn't have done it in that way, you know? So right. I right. don't know. Right. I'm rambling yeah. at this point, but no, it, it, what you're, what you're, what you're touching on is really important. And, and, why it's, it's such a big part for me and so important for me to have, you know, have communication with people. And that's why I made uh, like these, what I call love chaos dialogues and group meetings as an important part to what love chaos is about, because we really need as human beings really need to have open way, pay, you know, pathways of, of, of conversation dialogue between each other to understand each other. And, um, I feel that like that is so important has been so important to my life in recent years and getting better has been able to have these uh, ways to communicate with people so that it, it really gets me out of my own head. It takes my, my head out of my own ass 
and really allows me to see things for the way they really are. And sometimes, you know, as, as brilliant as we can be, as self-conscious as we can be, we, there may be things that we don't see that other people do. And uh, that's really the power of, of, of conversation, of dialogue, and of group meetings, you know. And, and I, I love group dynamics. I love being in a, in a room with other people, and we're all talking, and we all are opening and sharing, and we're able to understand each other because it's some, some of the most beautiful and meaningful experiences I've, I've had have been in, in conversation with other people and in and, and real meaningful conversation with other people where we, we can talk about our real feelings, our real thoughts, our issues, and other people can point things out to me and I can point things out to them. And that's where I've done a lot of my, my growing. And I think that's where people can grow uh, a tremendous amount is when we have those, you know, those kinds of connections, those back and forth between each other. Uh, dude, I agree 100%. I think that's a great uh, place to wrap up here. Tell people where they can find, I guess, both the books, because we, you know, we weaved in material from both of them to the chat here. So where can they find Love Chaos, the first book? Where can they find uh, Love Chaos and Theory and Practice? And where can they keep up with you personally if they'd like to? Yeah, sure. So it, both of the books are available on Amazon, and uh, they're both available in the print version and the Kindle version. Um, the uh, the the one that just came out recently is is only for uh, six dollars on Amazon for the print, ninety nine cents for the Kindle. I wanted it to make it ch- as cheap as I possibly could, so people could get it. Um, it's a short book; it's just a little over a hundred pages. The first book of Love Chaos, I um, in- include. I utilize full color imagery on the interior um, that sort of helps the the 45 chapters, 45 insights. And so because of that, of the color that's on the inside, it it means that I had to charge more uh, for $23 for that first book that came out in 2014. So, um, but both books are available on Amazon. And, uh, you know, for me, um, I am, I am an open, open book. Uh, I am open to people communicating to me. People can start Love Chaos Dialogues with me uh, directly one-on-one. Uh, I've been doing them for uh, several months now, both here in person in, in Los Angeles. I've done them online. I've done them through texting. I've done them through phone calls. And it's really helped a lot of people. Um, and it's really simple, very conversational. person just brings a question that they have about their life, and we discuss it. And... Uh, There will be more uh, group dynamics that I'll be doing and pursuing in 2020 next year, both in person here in Los Angeles and online. Uh, And but for now, you know, I can do Love Chaos dialogues with people. It's free of charge uh, right now. Uh, Is it's free of charge because I I want to engage people not to get money from them Um, in the future. If it uh, continues to grow, my time will be limited and I may need to charge for doing dialogues in the future, but for right now it's free. So if people want to take advantage of that and utilize uh, however I can help in some way, they can. And uh, probably the best way to reach out to me, there's a number of different ways, but you can just go simply go to my website, which is love-chaos.com. And on that website, you'll see my works of fiction. I've got four other books of fiction, my music albums, uh, other things on there. And so, but you'll see everything on there, including reviews and other things. Uh, but you can, there's different ways to reach out to me on Facebook, email, and so forth. And that can all be found at my website, which is um, L-O-V-E dash C-H-A-O-S dot com. Absolutely, man. I'll link all of that in the show notes for people so they can easily just click through if they're interested and learning more about the books or yourself and man, Derek Hunter, dude, really enjoyed the chat. Thanks so much again for the time and taking us through your love chaos belief system here. I found it very valuable and I hope that people listening will, you know, find it just as valuable because I think it's a, it's sort of just a great reminder of what life is actually really all about. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's been absolutely a great pleasure and I look forward to, to continuing to uh, our communications and I look forward to your new, your new, new podcast as well. Absolutely, man. Well, yeah, please do keep in touch. You know, uh, the internet's a, it's a terrible thing, but it's also a beautiful thing if you know how to use it right. Exactly. Exactly.